Hey, um, I'm so delighted to be here with you tonight. Um, I, I want to uh, tell you uh, a little s story about myself, if I can. I tell you what, hold that thought. You're going to hear a story. Before you hear it, I want to tell you something else, which, which is a bit of a, um, an interesting challenge, maybe a little conundrum for us tonight. And as I tell it to you, I'm going to ask um, first for a little bit of, of data from you to see if it matches what the research says. Did you know there's research? that has to do with how long the average person can keep their attention focused on a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and as someone who has to give many lectures every week and who also is a researcher, um, I, I have to tell you I was a little bit, I found it a little daunting when, when I got the, the results of, of this research. So, but I, I need to ask for a show of hands. I need you to be completely honest with me, okay? You will not hurt my feelings in any way. You will not make me panic. Um, in any form or fashion, even though I believe we're supposed to go, is it is it true, Jessica, for uh, uh, till eight o'clock tonight? That's all we have. We have okay. We have until eight. Well, you know, if you ever give a, a college professor, um, you know, an open-ended kind of invitation like that, uh, we will have no trouble filling the time. Now, some other folks may have other things they need to go do. Uh, all right. So here's a question: How long can you keep your attention focused on? A lecture, let's say a lecture based on PowerPoint slides and you're getting the information. What some of my students at KU affectionately refer to as an info dump, right? You get all this info that's dumped uh, uh, into your lap. And, and I need you to further assume this is on average. This is not for a particularly engaging or riveting presentation, just your average. It's not bad, it's just average. Um, okay, so I need to ask for a show of hands. How many of you would say your answer is um, over 30 minutes? Really? Be honest. Really? Wow. You, you are, I need you guys in my classes at KU. Um, <laughs> how many of you would say between 15 and 30 for you? Okay. How many, that looks like the majority maybe. How many would say under 15? Under 15. All the folks I hope. Uh, ho yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Now, I'm, I'm with you. You're kindred, you're, we're, we're, we're kindred spirits. We're talking continuous. Before your mind, oh, I, yeah, see, I didn't even make that completely clear. Um, before your mind starts to wander off, you know what I'm talking about? When you're hearing somebody talk and they say something, kind, you know, eventually they'll say something interesting, right? I mean, if you put enough monkeys at enough typewriters, eventually they'll type out a, a line of Shakespeare um, just at random. So, I mean, even the most boring speaker eventually will say something interesting and then your mind is off to the races. You're kind of thinking about that thought, you're, right? About five minutes. About five minutes? About five minutes? Okay. Now, the, the average adult can track it for about 20 minutes. The, that's the average adults. It looks like we have very many above average individuals here tonight. God bless you. I'm so glad you came. Um, but nobody, almost nobody that's been studied, can actually track information continuously for two hours. Um, right? <laughs> Don't we break? I guess we do now. <laughs> sure, we can, we can, we can break uh, at, at the halfway point. My, my point in raising this is, is not to uh, discourage anyone, but rather to raise it in order to propose a solution, which is instead of saving all your questions and comments for the end, why don't we make this a little more conversational, okay? So, uh, because, let's think about it. Can we track, can you track a good conversation longer than you can track a typical boring lecture? Right? You, you can track conversation for a long time. The other thing that, that's been found that people can track really easily is stories. Stories. And so as I'm going to be talking to you tonight about the story of how I came to be a psychotherapy researcher, specifically um, devising a uh, psychotherapy for depression that n never in my wildest dreams would I have thought I would be doing 15 years ago when I came to the University of Kansas. Um, so we'll make this conversational and we'll also uh, be sh sharing some stories. Now, my first story. Um, I was at the University of Colorado. You like to spend time in Colorado, especially in the summer when it's about 100 degrees here and it may be, you know, about 20 degrees cooler there. I was at the University of Colorado living in Boulder, went hiking multiple times a week and loved it, loved it. But it, it was not, you know, it didn't strike me as the best place necessarily to raise a family. And I wasn't on the tenure track, and this job opened up at KU. And I knew the school by reputation, but I'd never been. Like many people, probably many of your distant relatives outside of Kansas, I had stereotypes about Kansas that proved to be totally false, right? So I, 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 I fly into Kansas City, and it's dark. 
um, so I don't really get to see the, the, the surrounding area. And I get picked up at the airport, and we drive back to this little bed and breakfast in the dark. And I get up the next morning, and it's glorious and sunny, and I'm walking around downtown Lawrence before my first interview, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And I'm thinking, I think I could actually live in Kansas. This is amazing. <laughs> um, but and here's, here's my, my little story. I keep hearing about Mount Oread. Mount Oread. Do we have any KU alums here? Any KU alums? Do, do, those of you who are not KU alums, do you, do you know what I mean when I say Mount Oread? Well, I was ignorant. And coming from Colorado, you know, in Colorado, when, some, when they say Mount, when they put Mount in front of a proper name, like, you know, Mount Albert, Mount, Har they have a Mount Harvard. Um, these are like 12,000, 13,000, 14,000 foot peaks. Now, right outside of Boulder, Boulder Valley, gorgeous, pristine valley, there are foothills that rise 3,000 feet out of the valley. They're called foothills. They're, none of them... <laughs> None of them are called Mount, okay? None of them. And so I'm hearing about this fabled Mount Oread, and people talk about it like it's nearby. So I'm getting really excited, and now I'm really intrigued because I'm, I'm thinking back to eighth grade geography class where I should have been paying more attention, wondering, so is, is eastern Kansas, maybe it's closer to the Ozark chain than I knew? You know, where, where and, and as I'm walking around campus during two days of interviews, every time I get a stray moment, I'm scanning the horizon, <laughs> expectantly, waiting to catch a glimpse of the fabled Mount Oread. <laughs> Finally, at the end of my sojourn in Lawrence, I get a little free time before we're about to take the trip back to the, the Kansas City Airport, and so I decide to go out hunting for Mount Oread. It's a true story. And I'm walking around campus, and, you know, I think I've been able to get a pretty good glimpse of the horizon in a full 360 panorama and don't see it. So I'm walking back dejectedly to Fraser Hall, which is where the psych department is. And as I'm getting close, I stop a young undergrad. And it's, it's late in the afternoon and campus is cleared out. And there's this guy, and he looks actually a lot like some of the, the folks that you see in Boulder. He looked, and forgive me for saying this, because not that we have a lot of folks at KU like this, but he looked kind of like a stoner. Um, he, I mean, God bless him, he, ha he had on his tie-dye t-shirt, and, and he, I think he was playing hacky sack or something. And, uh, and I said, excuse me, but um, can I ask you a question? He says, uh, sure. I said, um, can you tell me where I could find Mount Oread? And he says, uh, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, seriously, I've, I've been looking for it for two days. He said, dude, <laughs> you're standing on it. <laughs> <laughs> Apropos of absolutely nothing other than it just, that was my introduction to Lawrence. And once he said that, I knew, by God, I, I had to come and live here. I've been here 15 and a half years, uh, no plans to leave anytime soon. All right, I'm going to be talking tonight about clinical depression. Uh, I'm going to come at it from a little bit of a different angle, maybe, than many of you have, many of you have heard. Um, the very first thing I want to talk about, of course, if you, if you look, I've, can you guys see this, this laser pointer, by the way? A lifestyle-based approach to healing depression. A lifestyle-based approach. That's not the approach that we typically think of when we think about depressive illness. Um, and I, I hope you're at least a little bit intrigued. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the story of how I came to see it this way as we move on. But first things first, humanity, a timeline. If we put the entire history of anatomically modern human beings and our immediate preceding ancestors on a timeline. We go back about 1.8 million years as um, a genus. And for the vast majority, over 99.9% .9 of that time, our ancestors made their living as hunter-gatherers. They hunted, they gathered, very much like modern aboriginal tribes do today. They've been relegated to some very marginal lands and very sparsely populated corners of the planet. But at one time, the entire planet was largely covered with our ancestors who made their living as hunter-gatherers. Um, about 12,000 years ago, agriculture was invented. And you can see, can you guys see here in the front row? So we had the agrarian revolution for about 12,000 years. People in parts of the world began, they learned the really neat trick of growing crops and herding livestock. And it changed their way of life. 
it wasn't a very, it was just a blink in uh, geological terms, in genetic evolutionary terms. And then we had, speaking of blinks, about 200 years ago, the Industrial Revolution, of course, which radically changed the way people live. It has been suggested by modern geneticists that the overwhelming majority of the selection pressures that shaped who we are, that shaped our genome, that shaped the assumptions that our genes have as they build our bodies, as they build our brains, the overwhelming majority of that experience was as hunter-gatherers. What does that mean? We are largely walking around with Stone Age genes, building Stone Age bodies and Stone Age brains, <laughs> expecting to encounter a Stone Age world, largely, a set of genes that have been modified a little bit by 12,000 years of experience in an agricultural setting, like what? Anybody, out of curiosity, anybody know of a genetic change that's happened just in the last 12,000 years to reflect the different environment we face in an agrarian? Lactose tolerance. Exactly right, yeah, lactose tolerance. The ability to digest milk, and it's one of its main constituents, uh, lactose, after we're um, beyond the age of about three or four. If we look at modern Aboriginal groups today, nobody can digest milk after about the age of three or four. Why? Because they never encounter it after they've been weaned. Does that make sense? And yet, all over the planet, when you have populations that have um, encountered milk for about 10,000 years, you've had mutations that have rippled through the population. And now, okay, great, there's a little bit of genetic change. But for the most part, we're, does that, does that surprise you, by the way, to hear that we're kind of largely walking around with a set of Stone Age genes? I'll give you an example. See if this makes it hit close to home. How many of you have children? Children. They could be grown. Um, okay. How many of you can remember the sorts of things that your kids, when they were, say, two, three years old, that they easily, almost automatically, almost like they were hardwired, easily acquired fears of? What are the kinds of things that kids are just really, really easily afraid of. <laughs> yeah, uh, scary strangers with beards and, yeah, oh, wait a minute. Um, yeah, um, so the dark, the dark, how about going to bed in the dark? In fact, what, do, do you remember what your children told you when they were really, really, really small, when you tried to get them to go to bed by themselves in the dark? What was, what sort of fate did they fear would befall them? Monsters. They're monsters that are going to do what? Eat, eat them. Right. Okay, now I want you to think about this. If you were, <laughs> if you were a hunter-gatherer, and by the way, if you're a hunter-gatherer, you're on a lifelong camping trip with 50 to 100 of your closest friends and relatives, <laughs> lifelong camping trip, out in the wild, um, and you take your two-year-old and you put them by themselves alone in the dark to sleep, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be eaten by monsters, right? <laughs> Our children still know this. They know it innately. They don't really have to be taught very much. They certainly find it very plausible, at least, the first time they hear that, that idea, right? Does that make sense? The things that we innately fear, spiders, snakes, strangers, heights, electrical storms, they're things that made sense to fear in the ancestral environment, in the Paleolithic environment, in the Stone Age environment. Not so much anymore. You know the rate of death? due to spiders and snakes in 21st century America, minuscule. The things we want our children to naturally fear, <laughs> running out in the street, chasing after a ball, <laughs> handguns, uh, electrical sockets with, you know, forks that look enticing to, you know, will that fit? In there? I mean, we can't get the, oh, uh, stovetops, right? They don't innately acquire those fears. Why? There's a mismatch between the expectations of the environment we're going to encounter and the one we find ourselves encountering. Why? Over the past 200 years, our environment has radically mutated. <laughs> and it leads to some bizarre juxtapositions. We can make them work. It's not always pretty. It's not always elegant. But we can make it work. Would it be safe to say, and I, I really need to ask somebody to weigh in on this, is it a, a fair assumption that if we could take one of the founders of our great republic from the 1770s, snap our fingers, bring them into 2012, and let them see how we live today, that they would be astonished. 
that they would find our way of life. And we're talking about, can somebody do the math on that really quickly? About 240 years? 240 years, which by the way is six generations. Six generations, which is a blink of an eye in geological time. Six generations, and our way of life is unrecognizable to them. Well, it turns out that several key functions of our bodies and our brains are still calibrated to an ancestral environment in ways that no longer make sense for our well-being in the 21st century. I want to give you a very important example. It's one that's going to have implications for depression and several other forms of illness that we may encounter in our own lives and that of our loved ones. Let's talk about the stress response. How many of you remember back to health class, back in junior high, high school, where you learned about the stress response, the fight or flight response? Does that, does that ring a bell for you? The fight or flight response, when do we get it? What does it do for us? Why do we have it? Under what circumstances should the fight or flight response go off? Danger. When there's danger. What kind of danger? Danger, danger of danger. some sort of actual physical danger? Perceived, uh, perceived actual physical danger. So um, a predator, another hostile human being, uh, natural storm. Disaster, right? You ever been uh, hiking above tree line when an electrical storm <laughs> blows up? That happened to me a few years ago. I was very foolish, set off too late, and, I, you know, and I was warned, storm's coming in. I said, oh, I'll see it in time. No, it didn't happen. I can tell you, I had a vigorous fight or flight response. Now, why do we have it? We, you know, we know about it, it starts in the brain, when we perceive danger, and it, it actually, the, the message travels to our control gland, the pituitary, travels down to our adrenal cortex, which releases adrenaline and other stress hormones. You may have heard of them, like cortisol. Why do we have it? Why have we been wired to have a fight or flight response? And by the way, every mammal has it. Protection. Yeah, in, in what way? What, are, what does it prepare our bodies to do? Fight or, fight, fight or flee, right? To fight or, vigorous physical activity. Vigorous physical activity. Now, I want you to, to, to note and remember two things about the fight or flight response. One is that it's incredibly costly to the body. It's incredibly costly. Why? Because we dump all kinds of sugar, glucose, in the bloodstream to be available as fuel for our muscles. Right? Costs a lot of energy. Cortisol, one of the key stress hormones, prepares, not only does it elevate our blood sugar, but it also is a really nice steroid. So it prepares us to heal injuries, to tamp down inflammation, right? It's costly, but it's worth it if it saves your life or it helps you have an adaptive response to what? To the second feature of our fight or flight response, which is it's designed for a very short term situation. That make sense? When our ancestors, let's just you know, go back in time 15,000 years. If you had an ancestor 15,000 years ago that was having a vigorous fight or flight response, how long would they, in a typical situation, how long would they have needed to have that go off? What do you think? Anybody? If you have a response, raise your hand, okay? I'll, I'll pretend like I'm back at, at KU. It's so much easier that way if I can call on somebody. Yeah, go ahead, right here in the front row. More than 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And why, why do you say that? I like the way you think. It's going to have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're going to have a quick resolution the vast majority of the time. Can you imagine maybe a scenario that could go as long as an hour? I mean, if we have a fertile imagination, we might be able to concoct a couple of scenarios that might last an hour or two. We might even be able to come up with a hypothetical rare situation that might last several hours, right? But day after day after day in the ancestral human environment, no. No. Not going to happen. Not going to happen which is a good thing. Why? Because the stress response, our fight or flight response, is adapt, can you guys see this? Is adaptive in the short term, but it's toxic when it goes on for long. Chronic stress, the chronic fight or flight response is toxic. In the ancestral environment, A, it almost never happened, and B, there were lots of natural breaks built into their way of life that put the brakes on the stress response. 
We're going to talk in just a minute about what some of those natural breaks are and how we can reclaim them because it's really important. Now, I'm not going to belabor this point because I'm, bet, I'm betting that most of you are already, it'd be sort of like preaching to the choir, but let's see. Here's my claim. Modern life is really stressful. Modern life is perversely calibrated to keep our stress response engaged. All kinds of reasons why. Right, well, interacting with strangers. Turns out interacting with strangers is a somewhat stressful experience for most human beings. If you look at modern day aboriginal groups, they don't really enjoy interacting with strangers. In fact, very often those interactions turn somewhat ugly. Um, they find it stressful. It elevates their stress response. It does for most of us today. We live in a global village of over 7 billion people and guess what? When we hear news of tragedy or danger, can, can I get an informal survey? How many of you have heard some piece of news over the past, let's go the past week, of some sort of tragi tragedy or some, somebody who had something unfortunate happen to them in the past week? Every hand, virtually. How many of you have heard something like that in the past 48 hours? How about the past 24 hours? Virtually every hand. Now, here's what's interesting. In the ancestral environment, when your ancestors heard a piece of bad news, heard about something dangerous, like, oh, hey, you know Fred in that, that group right around that, the ridge in the river? Um, he said when he was out hunting three days ago, um, he was chased by a pack of hyenas. Okay? Now, did your world, your world, just become a more dangerous place, potentially? Do you have to upgrade your level of threat assessment? You do. You do. Do you see the point? It's subtle, but it's really, really important. The point is that our brains are wired in such a way that we attend to gossip about danger, gossip about tragedy, gossip about bad things that are out there, as if they are personally salient, personally relevant. Why? Because our ancestors lived in a very small world, and every bit of news was meaningful. Now we live in a world of seven billion neighbors, and we hear about their tragedies all the time. We hear about their dangers, and most of us walk around thinking the world is much, much more dangerous than it really is, and we feel stressed every time we turn on the TV, every time we listen to the radio, every time we go to Google News. Does that, does that ring true for you? Uh, the other problem, of course, is that Brad Pitt is also your neighbor, guys. <laughs> Ladies, Angelina Jolie is your neighbor. What does that mean? that our brains are wired in such a way that we compare ourselves to the people that we encounter, that we hear about. We compare ourselves. We get a sense of where we rank, especially with our peers, same-sex peers. If you were in an ancestral hunter-gatherer band, the average size was about 50 or so. On average, 25 male, 25 female. How many same-sex peers would you have? Let's say um, peers would be plus or minus five years of your age. You might have three or four, five. You with me? There's your peer group. Imagine that's your world. You've got four, five people that you're comparing yourself to. What do you think the odds are that you're going to be the best in your peer group at something? It's, it's overwhelmingly certain that you would have been, think about this, every person here, think about this, you would have been the Michael Jordan of something, of finding new water sources, the Michael Jordan of, you know, skinning a freshly killed deer, the Michael Jordan of preparing some tasty yam stew, <laughs> right? You would have been the best, and everybody would have known it and valued you for it. Why? Because your gifts and your abilities would have benefited everyone else in your group. And yet today, in a global village of 7 billion, it's hard to be the best at anything. Why? Because we're always thinking about, oh, I've heard about that famous person who does it even better. Does that make sense to you? Do you follow it? So the modern world is incredibly stressful. Of course, if you want to get a, a really easy sense of how stressful, think about this issue of 24-7, 365 connectivity. Have any of you had the luxury that I had this past summer of unplugging and disconnecting for several days? 
Have you had that experience of completely, and, and you, you, anybody kind of go through withdrawal for a little while? Where you're just like, oh, I gotta check my, my cell phone, I gotta check my email, I gotta check the news, I gotta, and then after a couple days, what happens? It turns out it wasn't quite, go ahead. You, yeah, you just start to kind of really habituate and, and all of a sudden, you know what happens? Your stress hormones drop. Your blood pressure drops. Your resting pulse drops. Your level of well-being goes up. Why? We were never designed for the pace of 21st century American life. Our brains were not designed for it. Our bodies were not designed for it. And it, it leads to potentially toxic effects. And it turns out, in fact, that the chronic runaway stress response is an underlying trigger not only of depressive illness, which we're going to talk about in more detail in just a bit, it can actually cause brain damage. I'm not saying this to scare you, but to inform you. Cortisol, one of the key stress hormones, actually blocks the brain's major repair hormone. If you're keeping score at home, it's called BDNF. You can look it up, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF, we need lots of it in the brain to repair damage that's done every day by, have you ever heard of free radicals? These are molecules that slice and dice cellular machinery. Cortisol suppresses that key growth hormone. And over time, it can actually lead to brain damage, shrinkage of the frontal cortex, shrinkage of the hippocampus, which is ground zero for our short-term memory function. In fact, I'll give you a little tidbit. It's kind of fun. You can share this at a family gathering sometime in the next few weeks if you want to regale your loved ones with your newfound knowledge. Um, stress actually temporarily impairs short-term memory function. It does. When we are stressed, cortisol suppresses that, that hormone I told you about, BDNF. Well, guess what BDNF does aside from repair brain damage? It literally helps us grow new memories. When you learn new information, you literally grow new connections between neurons and, and key networks in your brain. Without that growth hormone, you will not grow them. Stress is toxic to our memory. And so if you've, have you had any senior moments <laughs> recently? You know what I'm talking about? Um, you got that tip of the tongue phenomenon? I'm, I'm only 49, and I, I get those moments sometimes. And it's almost invariably when I've been under a very high level of acute stress. Now that I know how toxic it is, I promise you it has changed the way I live my life in many, many ways, which I'll, I'll share with you as we go on. Um, anxiety, of course, by definition, is part of chronic stress. Sleep disturbance, both the quantity and the quality of our sleep will decline when we're chronically stressed. Our immune function is shot. Have you noticed how much more susceptible you are to illness when you're, when you're chronically and acutely stressed? Well, here's a big culprit that lots of folks are talking about. Can you guys see this? I don't know if you have to crane your neck. I'll, I'll, I'll say it out if you can't. Inflammation. Inflammation. Anybody know what inflammation actually is? When we talk about inflammation, because it's a big, big deal in medical research, and many of our most important illnesses, many of our biggest killers, are inflammatory illnesses. Why do we have inflammation, first of all? What, does what is it designed to do? Because we are designed to have inflammation under certain circumstances. Do you know? The body's natural response to protect, it would go to the Good. of pain and illness, and it swells and it brings... Brilliant. And yeah, and let me repeat this for, for folks who can't hear in the back. Um, what, what, what she just said is, and maybe I can, can illustrate this with an example. You ever had a splinter? Right? And it gets all inflamed. How do you know it's inflamed? It gets red and swollen. Why? Because blood has been rushed to the site. Why? Yeah. Any, right. So we have, we have antibodies. We have um, natural killer cells that will attack any invading pathogens. And we, we have tissue repair factors that will grow new tissue, repair the injury. Okay. So without inflammation, without that ability, this is kind of interesting to think about. We wouldn't survive for long. Can you imagine if every time you got a splinter, every time you twisted an ankle, it would never heal. Every time you got a splinter, you would be risking a, a life-threatening invasion of some sort of pathogens. Okay, so we need to have inflammation, and yet 
What happens when we have too much of it? What happens if your immune system, which is the source of inflammation, if your immune system gets the idea that your whole body has been invaded? That your whole body is sort of riddled with splinters, as it were. Then your immune system starts attacking healthy tissue. Have you heard the term autoimmune? That's exactly what it means. Autoimmune illnesses are simply inflammation run amok. Well, guess what? The average American, the average American has far too much inflammation attacking their body. The average American has unhealthy, frighteningly unhealthy levels of inflammation. And in fact, if we look at so-called diseases of civilization or diseases of modernity, these are all of our biggest epidemics. Every single one is characterized by high inflammation. It is the common denominator. It is the thread that runs through every illness of civilization. Obesity, of course, you've all heard the news, the sad news about our epidemic there. Diabetes, which is now affecting, if you, look at, if you count pre-diabetic um, syndromes as well, over one in four Americans. Hardening of the arteries, the precursor to heart disease. It's an inflammatory illness. In fact, the single best blood marker of predicting risk of dying of heart disease, based on my review of the literature, which just happened um, last year, is a marker of inflammation, not a marker of blood cholesterol. It's called C-reactive protein. At least that's one of the best ones, CRP. You can talk to your, your doctor, your cardiologist about it. Um, it measures how much inflammation you have going on in your body. Heart attacks are typically preceded by an inflammatory response in the arteries that feed the heart. Inflammation is a killer. Asthma, fibromyalgia, many forms of cancer. If there's been one insight and innovation in my research group over the last several years, it's simply been that we think depression belongs on this list. Depression is an inflammatory illness. Here's something many of you may not have walked in here knowing tonight. The inflamed brain is a depressed brain. Inflammation is powerfully capable of triggering depression. Well, what are we talking about with depression anyway? I bet most of you know, because you came to this talk tonight, but I'll bet many of you also know somebody who has a completely wrong idea of what we mean when we're talking about depressive illness, when we're talking about clinical depression. So what's the misunderstanding? What, what would people misunderstand if they heard someone say, oh, um, I'm battling depression? Get over it. Yeah, many of my patients have been told exactly that. Get over it. Personality related. Oh, yeah, this is your personality. You're just a slacker. Um, this is just something under your control. Inherited traits. Say that again. Uh, okay, it might, yeah, it might, might be, you know, part of your per a trait of personality that even that you inherited, but, but not something terribly serious. What does depression mean as the term is used in everyday conversation? Not among us clinicians, not among um, treatment providers, but in every, if you heard somebody at Costco say, Sadness. Sadness. Exactly right, right? How long does it last? At most, maybe less, right? In other words, and, and what is it in reaction to? The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? In other words, the human condition? In other words, if you live long enough, we can take it to the bank. At some point, we will all be sad, right? At some point, we will all be sad. That's kind of a sad thought. At some point, we will all be happy as well, <laughs> hopefully before we leave tonight. Um, that sadness is not what we clinicians mean by the term depression. And, and unfortunately, I believe, and maybe some of you can help me with this, I believe one of our biggest jobs, one of my biggest tasks as a depression researcher is helping the field come up with a better word for this illness. Because when we're talking about depressive illness, we're talking about something that's debilitating, that changes the functioning of the brain, changes the functioning of the body, changes our hormone function, robs us of the most restorative phase of sleep, 
robs us of our energy, robs us of our concentration, robs us of our memory, robs us of our ability to experience pleasure, lights up the brain's pain circuits. I had a patient not too long ago who told me about a good friend of his who was battling a form of cancer. It was um, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Have you heard of it? Thank God it was curable. It was curable. So his friend is going through chemo for Hodgkin's. And it was brutal. He's going through chemo. And his hair falls out. Have you ever known somebody going through chemo? Hair falls out. He's nauseated. He's throwing up all the time. He feels like hell. He feels like he's going to die. But he knows he's getting better. Okay? Now, while he's going through chemo, all of his friends and acquaintances and loved ones rally around him. And they're all like, oh, you're so brave. You poor guy. You know, this is so hard. We're here for you, buddy. You know, hang in there. People are saying, you know, hang in there. We're here for you. Nobody says snap out of it. Nobody says get over it. See where I'm going with this? This friend who was fighting Hodgkin's lymphoma, who had cancer, who was going through chemo, five years earlier had battled an episode of clinical depression. And so he tells my patient, guess what? Cancer is a walk in the park compared to depression. Chemo is brutal and yet I would take it any day of the week before I would take another episode of depression. Does that put a face on it for you? This guy said depression was about 10 times worse. And yet, when I was depressed, nobody could see it. My hair didn't fall out. I didn't have involuntary episodes of projectile vomiting. <laughs> which is, you know, a hard thing to hide. So nobody rallied around, and people said stupid things like, hey, come on, snap out of it. As if, he said, as if I didn't want to snap out of it, as if I wouldn't give anything to be able to feel better. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about depressive illness. It leads in this country to over 30,000 deaths every year due to depression-linked suicide. Why? Because depression can rob a person of their will to live. And as I mentioned, it lights up the brain's pain circuitry. People who are suffering from clinical depression feel a kind of pain that they can't quite put into words. They don't really know where it hurts. They just know it hurts. And they want as any sane person wants. They want escape. They want relief. For some of them, the desperation mounts to such a level that the ultimate tragedy ensues. So I take depression really seriously. I take it really personally. I've known people whose lives were cut down by this illness. I've had loved ones who suffered years of torment. And yet, it's an epidemic. So when, we talk, when I say depression is an epidemic, believe me, I'm not just throwing it around in a cavalier fashion. 23% of all Americans, it's estimated by age 75, based on our best epidemiology, by age 75, will get depressed. That's probably an underestimate. There's some evidence of at least a tenfold increase in the US since World War II. We get a real sense of it if we look, and I, I'm not going to bore you with lots of um, detailed charts and graphs, but I just want you to, to, to take, get a sense of what the epidemic is like from this picture. What I've got here, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but age here on the horizontal axis, lifetime risk of depression on the vertical axis, this is 5%, 10%, 15 and these different colored lines are different age groups, different generations, okay? So what do I have here in red? These are folks that were 60 and above. And notice that by the time they were in middle age, 5% of them had been depressed lifetime. 5% by the time they're middle age. 
And here we have the uh, baby boom cohort. And notice by the time they're in middle age, it's 15%. The next generation is getting depressed at a higher level. Look at the next generation. This is Generation X. By the time they're in their 30s, it's already almost 25%. Now look at the kids that I teach in their late teens and early 20s. And notice that by the time they're in their early 20s, their lifetime rate of depressive illness, remember, debilitating, brain damage inducing potentially, lethal illness, 25%. And if you can extrapolate that line out into their middle age, by the time they're my age, it's going to be over 50% if we don't do something to turn around this epidemic. Notice, by the way, that this epidemic has increased over the past couple decades at the same exact time when we've seen a 300% increase in the use of antidepressant medications. We've seen a 300% increase in the use of antidepressant medications. One out of every nine Americans, according to the Center for Disease Control, is currently taking an antidepressant medication. One out of every nine Americans above, oh, excuse me, above the age of 12. One out of every nine above the age of 12. Has it eradicated the epidemic? No. Has it at least slowed it down to the point where it's leveled off? No. Are they game changing? Not in my book. And I say that not as someone who came here tonight to bash medications because they've saved many lives. For those for whom they are helpful, they can be a godsend. But the dirty little secret among us clinical researchers is that the medications do not live up to the marketing hype. If you look at the outcome data, the actual data, they have not lived up to the marketing hype. I wish they did. Nothing would make me happier than if we had game-changing medication. Well, here, here's a statistic for you. Some of you have heard it. It alarmed me when I heard it. As the father of a 15-year-old, the average teenager right now in the U.S. is spending seven and a half hours every day interacting with a screen. And oh, by the way, that doesn't, does not include the hour and a half that they spend on average texting. That doesn't even count in their screen time. That, that counts school days, by the way. So nine hours a day interacting with a screen or their, their thumbs on the, the keypad texting. Screen time instead of FaceTime with our friends and loved ones, right? So the quality of our interaction with others is being eroded, and we're going to talk about that. But also the stress, and we talked just a little while ago about the, the bizarre beauty of just unplugging. And by the way, I'm not, do you know the term Luddite? Luddite? I mean, somebody who wants to just completely obliterate all technology? I'm not a Luddite. I want to keep my, I want to keep my, I like my iPad, okay? All right, so... What are some exceptions? This is one of my favorite. I love this slide. This, this, is, this is the Kaluli people of Papua New Guinea. They're one of the few remaining aboriginal people groups on the planet, still living as our ancestors lived. Hunters, they're not technically hunter gatherers they're, they're foraging horticulturalists. They hunt, they gather, but they can also grow the sago palm, so they kind of sort of have a crop. Um, but they live basically the way our ancestors lived. They have small groups, 50 to 100 people, so, why am I so fascinated by the Kaluli? Because they're the only hunter-gatherer group that's ever been infiltrated by a Westerner, an anthropologist named Edward Schiepelin, and carefully assessed for the presence of mental illness according to our diagnostic criteria. Now, here's what's interesting. They have really hard lives. They have a high rate of infant mortality. They have a high rate of death due to violence. Not, by the way, within their group, but between their group and other groups. Within their group, not so violent at all. Between groups, pretty violent. Um, a high rate of parasitic illness. They don't have any of our modern comforts. They don't have any of our medical care. They have tough, tough lives. I don't want to trade places with them, but guess what? They don't get clinically depressed. They grieve when they lose a loved one. They grieve. They have ceremonies, rituals, a bereavement. They grieve like we ought to grieve, right? They, they really go at it. They know how to grieve. 
and they have rituals and ceremonies, and they know how to say goodbye, and they know how to cherish and celebrate the life of those who, who they leave behind, and then they move on. And they take their loved ones with them in their memories and in their stories. They don't get clinically depressed. And it fascinated the hell out of me when I first, excuse me, for, but is it okay if I spice it up with a little salty language here and there? <laughs> it's an adult crowd. Is it okay, Jessica? <laughs> Do I have the out. dean's blessing? Is the dean still here? Okay, if he's not here, I'm going to spice it up. Um, it's, it shocked the hell out of me. And I thought, what in the world is going on? How could it be that this group doesn't get depressed when they have all the reasons to be depressed? I'd be depressed, I think, if I had to give up everything and live the way they live. But they don't. And it fascinated me. And it got me thinking, wait a minute. What are they doing that we're not doing that the existing research already shows us can prevent depression and can fight depression even if we happen to be depressed right now. And so I started meeting with my graduate students in our research group and we found six things really, really quickly that just jumped out at us. We're going to talk about them over the second half of this presentation. We're going to talk about them in very practical ways. What can you be doing? What can your loved ones be doing that the Kaluli and our ancestors do all the time? Well, our ancestors don't still do them, but um, the Kaluli still do them, other aboriginal groups still do them in abundance. They capture the following intuition. See if it resonates with you. We were never designed for the sedentary, fast food laden, sleep deprived, indoor, socially isolated, frenetic pace of modern life. And there are at least six things that we can reclaim from a, an ancient way of life that we can bring into the present that can protect us from depressive illness and an array of other illnesses that can change brain chemistry more powerfully than any medication, that can change the way our body functions and the way we feel more powerfully than any chemical we can put into our bodies. Okay, I think we should probably uh, pick back up where we left off if we can. I know it's it's kind of like herding cats sometimes when you have a break in the, in the middle of a presentation. I see we have a congregation back there. But, um, yeah, okay. Well, um, so we, we left off last time talking about at least six things that we can, that we can do that are part of our day-to-day -day lives. None of them are particularly profound. None of them are, I mean, if, we, if you look at the list, none of them are necessarily something that requires a lot of expense, a lot of technology, n that necessarily requires that you hire a PhD level clinical psychologist um, to put into practice in your life, and, and yet um, they can have an absolutely profound impact. So let's talk about them one at a time. As you have questions as we go along, feel free to, um, to just raise your hand and I'll, I'll try to get to as many as I can. Now, Exercise, I have to acknowledge at the very outset and see if this is true for you, that for many Americans, exercise, despite appearances, is a four-letter word. Many, many people, when they, when they hear the idea of exercise or working out, they start to kind of get tense. They start to think about, oh, yeah, I should, I should do it. I should do it. I know I should, and yet I don't want to, right? I don't want to. I'm going to tell you something that might be the single most validating thing anybody has said to you in the last hour. Um, <laughs> exercise is completely unnatural. Exercise is completely unnatural. You're not designed to exercise. I'm not designed to exercise. We are designed to be physically active in the service of adaptive goals. The average visitor to Walt Disney World, you been to Walt Disney World? Does it look like a particularly fitness crazed crowd? <laughs> Typically not, right? I mean, just average. The average visitor to Walt Disney World has been found by the Disney Corporation uh, to walk between eight and nine miles per day during their visit. That is a high level of physical activity. It is almost on par with the fitness level of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Not quite. Hunter-gatherers have been studied and they engage in four plus hours of vigorous 
Physical activity every day. Doing what? <laughs> Running, walking briskly while they're chasing down food, while they're gathering, while they're erecting dwellings or carrying water. You with me? But it's always in the service of a goal. So what happens when you take, I mean, our brains, as it, when it comes right down to it, in most respects are not that different from, say, the brain of any other mammal. So let's take the lowly lab rat. Did you know that just like us, their brains are programmed not to exercise? You know what I mean by exercise? I mean like you're staring at a piece of equipment. You know that, that horrible feeling of dread you get in the pit of your stomach, you're looking at it, you're saying, I should get up there on that thing. It's a treadmill, it's an elliptical trainer, stationary bike. And there's a piece of your brain that's screaming out, don't do it. You're not going anywhere on that thing. So you take a lab rat and you, now you can take the lab rat and you can give it, have you ever seen those little exercise wheels? Where they can kind of lollygag and stroll at their own pace. They're fine with that. They'll get up on the wheel every once in a while just out of sheer boredom if you don't give them like natural rat things to do. Because it's better than just sitting, right? But if you talk about like aerobic level activity, like getting their heart rate up where, you know, where it needs to be, like you know, they're really, you put them on a treadmill in a harness where they can't escape, you know what they do? They squat down on their haunches and protest <laughs> till the treadmill starts to wear the fur and then the skin off their, <laughs> off their, off their backside. They, they feel our pain when it comes to the difficulty of forced exercise. What this means is, if you think about it, do hunter-gatherers ever turn to their companions and say, hey, um, you know, I know that we just did four, you know, four-hour hunt, but I'm going to just, you know, lace up my, no, I don't have anything to lace. I'm just going to, um, you know, go out and, and, and uh, run a 10K <laughs> just because. No. Why not? Why why would our brain be wired with a program that basically says never expend calories on an activity unless it's for a purpose? Does that make sense to you? Conserve energy. Conserve energy because our ancestors never had a reliable food surplus. They would have occasional food surplus, but then six months down the road they might have famine, right? So your savings account was the fatty tissue on your body, <laughs> which explains a lot. Um, and yet, you would never want to squander calories on pointless activity. So how can we take advantage of this knowledge? Well, do we even want to take advantage of this knowledge? Hold that first question for a second. Let's think about the second, uh, the, the second question. Do we want to take advantage of this knowledge? Well, it turns out that exercise fights depression as powerfully as any known medication. One of my old mentors in grad school at Duke, Jim Blumenthal, has randomly assigned in two separate studies severely depressed middle-aged patients to one of two conditions. Either Zoloft, you've heard of it, the antidepressant, at a fairly high dose, or exercise. Now guess what kind of exercise? How hard would you have to exercise to change brain chemistry enough to be antidepressant. It was brisk walking. Oh. Brisk walking. Walking like you're late for an airplane, you know, kind of brisk, like you're, you're not messing around. You're, you're walking with a purpose. For hours, no. For 30 minutes, three times a week. That's it. 30 minutes of brisk walking three times a week compared head to head with Zoloft, and at the end of four months, both groups had an antidepressant response that beat placebo, sugar pill, right? There was no difference between the groups, but when they followed them up six months later, the folks who got the Zoloft were three times more likely to have had their depression return than the folks who were exercising. How can exercise be antidepressant? Well, it changes neurochemistry. It increases activity in circuits of the brain that use a neurochemical you've heard of called Dopamine, which is the key neuro neurotransmitter in the brain's pleasure centers, reward centers, those are centers that go dormant in depression. Exercise increases functioning 
in circuits that use the neurotransmitter called serotonin, which you've heard of, which helps put the brakes on the brain's stress response, which helps turn down activity in the brain's emotion centers. You've heard of some of you, the amygdala, which generates sadness and anxiety and fear. Exercise also has a really nice side effect. It might interest many of you. It slows down the aging process. British researchers have recently shown, did you know that, that um, we can look at your DNA? We could just get a little, um, little DNA sample, like uh, a Q-tip on the inside of your cheek, a little swipe on the inside of your cheek, get some cells. Look at the DNA, and it's like you've got your own tree rings. <laughs> really. Did you know you have your own molecular tree rings? They're, they're called, they're, they're protective caps on the end of each of your chromosomes. They're called telomeres. They're protective caps. And as we age, they shrink. And you can just look at the age, at the length of these telomeres and get a really, really good guess at a person's chronological age. But guess what? British researchers found that if you took a bunch of middle-aged folks, folks my age, roughly, 40s, 50s, um, and you looked at the telomere length of two sets of middle-aged folks. Group A is the, the couch potatoes. People that say, my whole adult life, I've been in that vast group of people that just really don't dig exercise. I just, you know, I do what I have to do, but I just don't exercise on any sort of regular basis. Group B, people that work out and have been workout fanatics at least, it was at least 45 minutes a day, an average of six, six days a week at least, okay? Now, I don't mean to brag or anything, but when I started doing this research, I was not in that latter group. Since I started doing it, I'm in that group. Guess what they found? The people who exercised regularly and had been through their adult life while they were in middle age, their biological age, as evidenced by their DNA, was 10 to 15 years younger on average than the couch potatoes. Have you ever known somebody that was in their 60s or 70s that seemed really freakishly spry? You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever noticed how common it was for that person to have been really physically active through much of their adult life? Have you ever seen, if you, if, if you don't know who I'm talking about, you need to go um, look it up on YouTube sometime. Jack LaLame, does that name ring any bells? Yeah. The original TV fitness guru. There's a great video of him at age 90 when he looks about 55, 60, he's 90, he looks and moves, holds himself like he's 55, 60 years old, and he's like swimming across to Alcatraz, pulling a tugboat behind him or something. It's crazy. <laughs> Freakishly youthful. Exercise has all these benefits. Now, here's the thing. If we want to be physically active, we need to remember that exercise is unnatural. You need to remember that image of that lab rat squatting down on its haunches wearing the fur off its backside. You're like that lab rat, and so am I in many respects. So what can you do? Find a, find a partner. Finding a partner often can provide a sense of purpose. Remember, we are designed to be physically active in the service of a goal. The goal will vary from one, what is a meaningful goal for you may not be meaningful for me, and vice versa. For some of us, I have two very highly spirited dogs getting out and walking. In fact, I like to run with them and they love it. They are in heaven. They beg for it. And I feel this warm, toasty glow inside because my doggies are happy, right? That, that works for me. It might be walking to a destination. It might be just the company of a friend. It might be um, a game-like activity. Something, because we're, you know, hunting is a game-like activity. Gathering is a game-like activity. So if you're doing something that's game-like, that will keep you engaged. My last little point on exercise really quickly is this. Some of you here are battling clinical depression or you have a loved one. You know somebody who is. When we're clinically depressed, we have a special difficulty initiating activities. Clinical depression turns down activity in the left orbital frontal cortex. It's a part of the brain that allows us to initiate things that we want to do. Does that make sense? In other words, when we're depressed, we can have a thought, I should do that. And then we can't actually make it happen. 
The part of the brain, how about this, that translates between your intentions and your actions, that part of the brain goes dormant when we're depressed. So some of you are hearing me right now and you're thinking, oh, I should do that. You need someone in your life. For many of us, if we don't have somebody who's reliable, who can give us that little nudge of initiative that we need to make it happen, it can be a personal trainer to get us started. When I started this research seven years ago, it never dawned on me in a million years that I would be telling people, hiring a personal trainer can really make a difference. I've seen dozens and dozens and, and dozens of lives transformed from that. It's the best money they've ever spent. If I could have five minutes with President Obama, I really think I might just bend his ear on how cool it would be if we could have a tax deduction for any money spent on enhancing our fitness. Because I'm telling you what, it would be pennies on the dollar. Whatever tax rebate people got for that, the federal government would get on the back end, multiply tenfold, a hundredfold in terms of savings with Medicare, Medicaid. You see it? So think about spending your money that way. Uh, okay, let's, let's talk about something else. Oh, by the way, Blumenthal and his research shows that in order to be antidepressant to change your brain chemistry, the, er, the activity needs to be aerobic. If you don't know how to take your pulse, I can show you um, if you want to hang around afterwards. Th there are lots of tutorials online. To be aerobic, you want to be somewhere between, this says 60 to 85 percent, that's fine. You get the best results, the research shows, if it's between 75 and 85 percent of your maximum heart rate. A good ballpark idea for what that is is 220 minus your age. So for me, it's about 171 is my max. Um, when I'm working out, I actually wear a heart rate monitor, which you can buy for about 30 bucks online. I wear it when I work out and I'm looking and I'm usually somewhere between 140 and 155. I go at it hard. Feels great. It didn't when I started, it does now. Somebody had a question right over here. Why are your dogs so keen to go out running whereas a lab rat is also keen on the moon? Brilliant question. Because dogs are descended from wolves, which are pack animals that follow an alpha, which is usually one of their parents, um, that tell them when it's time to go on a hunt. And while we're out running, they are scanning, looking for bunnies, which they often find looking for squirrels. And they look to me every single time. They're like, Daddy, can we go, get, can we go eat that one? Can we go eat that one? And you know what? They never, they never tire of it. Even though we've probably run hundreds of times and we've never eaten a single bunny, they... <laughs> To my knowledge? Well, actually, Teddy caught a dead one one time. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. So, so th for them, it, it has a purpose. And for me, it has a purpose because I'm making them happy. It's a great question. OK. Um, fatty acids. Where are we time-wise? Jessica, you were, you were teasing me that I, I, can't, I can't speak in, in, I can't even get this content in, in two hours. You said I couldn't do it in 20 minutes, which I'm starting to believe. Um, we're going to do it, though. In the, in the next, oh, sir, I'm just going to hold it right here. Is that okay? Is this going to distract you if I hold my watch right here? <laughs> I can see it. Is it distracting? Is it? I can't see it. There's a really bright. Oh, if I do that, I can see it. Wow. <laughs> Is that going to distract you? <laughs> no, not at all. That's not distracting, Dr. Lord. Okay, um, fatty acids. Really quickly. Your brain is mostly made up of fat. Did you know that? Your brain is 60% fat by dry weight. So if somebody calls you a fat head, <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are speaking. They are factually correct. Uh, you are, and so am I. Maybe they're paying you a compliment. I'm, I'm not sure. Probably not. There are two types of fats that your body cannot make. Most kinds of fat that are in your brain, your body can make. But there are two kinds that it cannot make. They're called omega-3s and omega-6s. They're called essential fatty acids. Why essential? Because they have to come from your diet. You can't make them. They're both critical for proper brain function, omega-3s and omega-6s. They're both critical for regulating inflammation. They play complementary roles in the body. Generally speaking, <laughs> omega-6s build inflammatory hormones. Omega-3s build anti-inflammatory hormones. In the ancestral diet, 
people, our ancestors ate omega-3s and omega-6s at a ratio somewhere between 1 to 1 and 2 to 1. The optimal ratio, when we put 6 first, the optimal ratio is roughly 2 to 1. If we did a blood draw on you or I and, and we wanted to know in advance, what should we be looking for for an omega-6, omega-3 ratio? We're going to do a blood test. About 2 to 1. In the brain, it's about 1 to 1. But in the blood, it's about 2 to 1. Now, modern American diet, unfortunately, can you see this? If you can, I'll, I'll tell it to you. 20 to 1. We need 2 to 1. It's 20 to 1. Why? What in the world is going on? By the way, this is not good. The 20, that's on the side of inflammation. The 1 is on the side of anti-inflammation. Okay, omega-3s are mainly found in grasses, plants, algae, and the animals that eat them. Grasses, plants, algae, and the animals that eat them. Well, we can't eat grasses or plants. We usually don't encounter algae. So our best bet is eating the animals that eat them. Okay? Omega-6s come from vegetable fats. They come from basically seeds and grains and the animals that eat them. So, hmm, corn oil, <coughs> cottonseed oil, you see it? Linseed oil, all, basically, almost all the oils that are used in virtually every type of fast food, in virtually every type of processed food. Oh, but wait, it gets better. Our meat supply. If you went back in time 150 years ago, or even 100 years ago, and had a piece of beef, what did it feed on? Grass. Grass and leafy plants that were out in the pasture. Oh, and insects, which were eating grass and leafy plants out in the pasture, so they were chock full of omega omega uh, Insects are actually a really good source of omega-3s. Oh. I'm not willing to start eating them anytime soon. <laughs> but just, you know, just in case anybody's curious. Um, what do our cattle and uh, poultry? Corn. Corn, grains, right? In fact, their, their stomachs are not even designed to eat corn. Do you know what happens if, if, a, if, a, if a typical garden issued garden variety cow starts eating a bunch of corn? First of all, it's going to turn up its nose at it unless you pump it full of growth hormones to make it freakishly hungry. Now it wants to eat the corn because it's so hungry, but then the corn turns its stomach so acidic that it becomes a seething cauldron <laughs> of bacterial growth. So we need to pump it full of antibiotics so that it won't die of a systemic bacterial infection. See the issue? But it grows really fast if we do all of, all of the above, and so it's really profitable to do it that way. And it's not good for us. It doesn't take rocket science to figure out that that's probably, intuitively we sort of get, that's probably not the best way that we should be taking in meat. And yet that's the way we all do it. And so what's the result? An extraordinary imbalance. This is just historic trends in fatty acid consumption in the U.S., omega-6s, omega-3s. And notice that by the time we get to the year 2000, whopping imbalance. Well, guess what? We have an epidemic of inflammation as a result of this imbalance. And, as I mentioned earlier, depression is an inflammatory illness. In countries across the world where they do not have this imbalance in omega-6, omega-3 dietary intake, they do not have the same epidemic of depression. The rates of depression are considerably lower. It gets better than that. When we take depressed patients and supplement them with omega-3 supplements found in, for example, fish oil, it's a, usually the most convenient source, we see a robust antidepressant effect. Now, some of you might have, how many of you have seen a news story at some point on something about omega-3s or fish oil for depression? How many of you have heard about this finding? Okay, now I've got to ask, and, and be honest, how many of you have ever seen a news story that said, well, there's some controversy about that, or maybe there was a finding or two where they didn't see the result? How many of you have seen that finding? Okay, N fewer, thankfully. Um, it, it is true, there have been some, some findings that did not see the effect, and you know why? I'm going to explain why right now. And this is a little bit of deep inside baseball, but hopefully it'll, it'll be useful information. There are three different kinds of omega-3s. There's one, if you're a vegetarian, you, you might say, well, wait a minute, there are vegetarian sources of omega-3s like flaxseed oil, have you heard of that, or walnuts. They're a source of a very short molecule called ALA. 
This is not anti-inflammatory particularly. It's a little anti-inflammatory. But the one that's really the building block of anti-inflammatory hormones is EPA. That's a medium-sized one. And then there's DHA. That's the longest one. That's DHA is the building block of brain tissue in the developing fetus and in a newborn, in a small child. Kids need lots of DHA. Have you ever heard of infant formula supplemented with omega-3s? That's what they supplement with, DHA. Unfortunately, DHA is not antidepressant. So when you look at research trials where they've given depressed patients DHA, those are the, the null findings. Those are the findings where they're like, ah, it didn't work so well. When you look at the studies where they gave EPA, especially in high quality supplement with, with sufficient antioxidants, they typically, oh boy, they typically have an antidepressant. We're not gonna go through this. This just is a really nice way of showing that all of these hormones here are built by EPA. These are anti-inflammatory. Um, these on this side are omega-6s, and these are all inflammatory hormones that are built. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Now, antidepressant dose of omega-3s. If you're going to get omega-3s, how much do you need? The best research evidence suggests that it's the starting dose is 1,000 milligrams per day of EPA. Now, I like to see patients take DHA as well. It comes along for the ride if you get it in a natural fish oil source. Does that make sense? I want you to have it in the way it's found in nature. Why? Because it, there's some evidence that it kind, of, it kind of freaks out the brain a little bit when it's only seeing EPA and not any DHA. Um, it taxes some of the enzymes that are involved, and, and it's, just, it's not an easy thing for the body necessarily to, to just get pure EPA. At least that's the way I read the research evidence on this. So we like our patients to get 1,000 milligrams per day of EPA to start. Some people benefit from 2,000. So if we're not seeing any sort of effect, any sort of benefit on any level after a couple weeks on 1,000, we'll often bump it up to 2,000. Now, um, actually, I'm going to shoot ahead to, here we go. I, if you look at the side of a bottle of fish oil supplement, omega-3 supplement, you will see um, Something like this. It says omega-3 fatty acids, 500 milligrams, but you have to look at the fine print. How much EPA? This one says 300. So notice that even though the capsule, by the way, it's, it's even more complicated than this because there'll be something that'll say one capsule equals, it'll be 1,000 milligrams per capsule of something. And people say, oh, I'm supposed to take 1,000, and this capsule has 1,000, so I should take one capsule. The, the kind of fish oil that you would buy at a typical drugstore would have 180 milligrams of EPA. If you do the math on that, if you can do it in your head, that means six capsules to get an antidepressant dose. Actually, six to 12 to get an antidepressant dose. I cannot tell you how many, literally, literally over 100 different individuals have come up to me after a talk and said, Dr. Lardy, I tried taking uh, omega-3 and it didn't work for me. I said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, do you mind if I ask, you know, what brand, what dose? And they'll say, well, just the kind I got at the drugstore, and um, I just, you know, it said serving size one. Yeah. I took the serving size. Now, I'm a polite guy most of the time. So my little thought bubble is, is like, oh, you know, congratulations, you've just taken one-sixth of an antidepressant dose. I'm not shocked that it didn't work. But what I say is, I'm afraid you didn't have an antidepressant dose. Um, it might be worth trying, trying it again at a higher dose. And uh, several individuals have then gone back taken it at a higher dose and reported that it actually is beneficial at a higher dose. Now, potential side effects, oops, um, there we go. Potential side effects, uh, if you get a low grade, a low quality fish oil, have any of you ever had indigestion or, God forbid, nasty fishy burps? That's what we call them in the business. Now, you know, how many of you have ever had nasty fishy burps at some point from a, that's a sign that you have just ingested a capsule of semi-rancid fish oil. And after your digestive juices in your stomach made their way through that outer gel coating, they spilled this nasty, rancid fish oil into your stomach. No wonder that you're burping that back up. By the way, just in case you were wondering, if it's semi-rancid, it is not psychoactive. It is not able to have the anti-inflammatory benefit that your brain and body need. What does that suggest? You really would benefit from a higher quality grade of fish oil. Now, the really good news is there are some very high quality supplements available for very low price now. Supply and demand have finally caught up on the fish oil front. What about on um, the, uh, can you actually buy the beef that is still, that is no longer? 
I love the way you think. If you guys couldn't hear this question, this gentleman. In the future, though, if you could raise your hand, but, but uh, still a good question. Um, the question is, well, what about doing it naturally? Can we just start eating grass-fed beef? Absolutely. If, you, if you're willing to double and triple your food budget, um, which, by the way, I am, and my family has. Um, I am. But most people are not. And remember, when somebody's clinically depressed, they're fighting an illness that's robbed them of their initiative, that's robbed them of their much of their energy and willpower. The last thing I'm going to ask them to do while they're acutely depressed is change the way they buy their f and prepare their food. Does that make sense to you? So what we do in our program is we start them typically with a fish oil supplement, but then we talk about for the long term what are some changes, what are some things we can do to cut out all those nasty omega-6s, all the processed food, all the fast food, or mu much of it. But I don't ask them to, to cut out the fast food right away. Um, it's a great question. Uh, any other questions about uh, taking fish oil supplement? Yeah. Um, I'm a little confused when you said the um, 300 milligrams EPA. Yes. And then you say you need six of this. What you, like, so you need 1,000 milligrams. Oh, yeah. Milligrams. Thank you. Um, the, the slide that I showed was actually of a high quality oh, okay. supplement that had 300 EPA per capsule. It does say EPA. Right. But the lo lower quality supplements, the kind that you typically, the, the most commonly consumed fish oil supplements only have 180 of EPA per capsule. A good one could have 300. In fact, um, a couple supplement makers now make a capsule. One capsule has 500. So it only takes two to get a potentially antidepressant dose. One of them is made by um, Now Foods. They, they, the N-O-W, so all capital letters. It's like, they're always orange bottles. You ever see them at the drugstore, health food store? Now, N-O-W, you can go online. You can buy them on Amazon. Um, it's called, I believe it's called Ultra EPA, I think. I think it's called, it's Ultra, I think it's Ultra EPA, and it's 500 milligrams of EPA per capsule, and you can get a month's supply at an antidepressant dose for about $10 or so. I mean, they've really come down, really come down in price. If you ever have the nasty fishy burps, the chances are you need to upgrade your supplement. What I look for are two things. The phrase uh, pharmaceutical, gr pharmaceutical grade, it's hard to say quickly, pharmaceutical grade and molecularly distilled. If they're going to all that trouble to produce it at that high quality, they're probably also not producing it under oxygen, and that's what causes it to go rancid. If you've ever had, you ever had raw fish out in oxygen, I mean, I mean omega-3s do not get along well with oxygen, let's put it that way. Uh, which, by the way, reminds me of another quick point, which is you don't want your omega-3s to oxidize while they're in your body, which means you will get more benefit if you take antioxidants along with it. Back to your point, antioxidants tend to work better when we get them in whole foods. What does that mean? Consider eating nine servings of fruit and vegetables every day so that your body can mount its most vigorous antioxidant response protect those omega-3s in your body, give your brain and body the best possible benefit. If you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to do that, then a daily multivitamin is a lot better than nothing. A lot better than nothing. Yes? Do you throw the fish oil in the freezer all the time or just if, if it's going bad? Oh, excellent question. Yeah, I, I do not keep mine oh. in the freezer, but some people will have a little indigestion with it. It's not that it's rancid, it's just that it's just kind of a little tough on the, on the stomach for people that, that don't have a cast iron stomach. And if you keep it in the freezer, then it, it generally doesn't completely thaw out until it gets past your stomach. And most people never notice that they're having any digestive issues any further. By the way, if you take super high doses of omega-3, you can have some blood thinning. If you are on a blood thinner, you must talk to your doctor. If you're on heparin, warfarin, coumadin, anything like that, you must, you, they can adjust the dose so you can take your omega-3 with that blood thinner, but you have to talk to them about it. Yes? Uh, using your example that you have on the screen there, you have a two to one EPA to DHA. Yes. But the standard supplement to take, get the thousand of that, is going to give you a different Ratio. Yeah, and this, the, the, this ratio is, is just a guideline. You know, you see several that come three to two, several that come two to one. The, the reason I like two to one is the, the best, most rigorous research, published research on omega-3s for depression used Manhattan oil, which um, actually comes in about a two to one EPA DHA ratio. And it's the best published research we have to go on. That's why I like to use that ratio. Um, and we've had great results in, in our, our own clinical trials at KU with it. Okay, Let, let's shift gears. Did I miss somebody? 
Are we good? Okay. Let, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Men, men, Haddon, men, somebody can look it up if you've got a smartphone, if you want to get a little more screen time in before we finish. I think it's M-E-N-H-A-D-E-N. But what is it? I mean, It's some cold water Atlantic fish that's oh. been, yeah, I, I, I don't, does anybody know? We have any ichthyologists present? Um, yeah, what are the odds that you'd ever have one of those when you need them? Okay. Um, <laughs> light exposure. I'm going to tell you about the fastest known Fastest known antidepressant response that you can get this side of ketamine, which is, um, we're not going to talk about a whole lot. Anybody, how many of you saw the news last year about ketamine, um, which is a street drug that when they, they injected intravenously to a point where they basically had surgical anesthesia with depressed individuals, they could get for some of them an antidepressant response within 24 hours? I don't recommend it, by the way. Um, <laughs> So assuming, you know, we're not going that route, light therapy is profoundly antidepressant. And when somebody takes a medication like, uh, what are some of the best sellers right now? Effexor, Lexapro, uh, Cymbalta. You guys could tell me lots of others. Wellbutrin. Thank you very much. Wellbutrin. I mean, we could, you know, have a list of about 15. When you take an antidepressant medication, you're typically told, if you're told accurately, oh, this will take three to six weeks to kick in right? Bright light therapy, when it has an effect, typically has an effect that's discernible initially within five to seven days. Five to seven days. This is particularly interesting and important this time of the year. Why? Because one out of three Americans experience at least some symptoms of depression during the cold, cloudy, dark, gloomy days of winter. One out of three Americans experience at least some clinically significant symptoms of depression. <coughs> Why? What is it about light? What is it about bright light in particular that affects our ability to function, that affects our mood, that affects our energy? Well, before we answer that question, I need to, to point out something that you may not have known, which is if you look at this light meter here, this is, by the way, the units are LUX, L-U-X. What you'll see is that indoor light ranges down on this end of the continuum, and outdoor light, especially on a clear sunny day, is on this side. Let me put it to you in the simplest possible terms. As bright as it is in here with these floodlights, if, if I were to step outside on a sunny afternoon, it would be 100 to 1,000 times brighter. Indoor lighting at its brightest is no match for outdoor lighting, and get this, our ancestors for hundreds of thousands of years were outdoors all the time. Their brains were wired with the expectation that their eyes are going to be getting very bright light from sunup to sundown. Now this gets really interesting, why? Because your body clock is not very accurate. Your body clock is not a Rolex. It's not even a Timex. It's like, you know, a Timex that's been left outside for a couple months and, you know, the body clock on average is off by about an hour a day. If, if you're like left in a cave somewhere where you have no external cues, your body clock starts to drift by an hour, sometimes two hours, every 24 hour period. You cannot keep your biological rhythms in sync without what? A daily dose of bright light. How big a dose? Circadian cue, ah, come back. Circadian Q, 2,500 lux. The brightest indoor light, 500 lux. In other words, at least five times brighter than anything you're going to get inside. What does that mean? Get outside, yeah. During the short, cold, cloudy days of winter, many Americans do not get their body clock reset. What does that mean? Their circadian rhythms start to drift. Their sleep starts to suffer. Their hormonal levels are out of balance. Their energy starts to sag. Their appetite starts to go crazy. They start craving carbs. They start wanting to hibernate. But wait, it gets better. You have specialized light receptors in the back of your eye. Do you remember the part of the eye called the retina? When you were back in school and you learned the retina has two kinds of light receptors, rods and cones, right? Remember? Rods for light and dark and cones for color. They lied. You have a third type just for the brightness of light. And those light receptors have a broadband connection right to the center of the brain where your body clock is, 
but it gets even better. Also to circuits that regulate your energy level that use dopamine, that have special connection to the reward circuits in the brain, and other circuits that use serotonin. Bright light changes brain function. It changes neurochemistry. Somewhere between 70 and 80% of the population report they get an immediate mood elevating effect when it goes from being very gloomy and cloudy to being very sunny, or when they go from a dark indoor space to going out on a bright. How many of you, by the way, I just had a show of hands, like if it's been cloudy and gloomy for several days and the sun breaks through, you just notice an immediate boost in your mood and energy level. Yeah, yeah, most of us, most of us here. We need bright light. We need it every day. It is antidepressant. It has been tested head to head. Now this is what really shocked the heck out of me. Not only has it been te tested head to head against medication for the treatment of seasonal winter onset depression, it's been tested head to head against antidepressant for non-winter onset, run of the mill depression. And it works. And it works. It's antidepressant. What kind of dose does it take? 30 minutes of bright light for most of us in the morning. For most of us within one hour of waking up. How bright is bright? 10,000 lux. That means outside on at least a partly sunny day. In other words, maybe cloudy, but you can see clear sky. Or an artificial light box. You can now buy an artificial light box like this for less than $100. Go on Amazon, look for 10,000 lux light box or several. Yes? What's the fitting correlation provided with these? Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent question. There's one other benefit from natural sunlight. So we covered the, the bright light. So in the wintertime, of course, uh, you know, the holiday season is quickly upon us. Some of you might like, um, a, as a gift, a uh, airline ticket to someplace warm and sunny. <laughs> you now have a wonderful rationale to give such a gift or to receive such a gift. Because if you happen to live in Kansas in the middle of winter, your options for getting the antidepressant dose of bright light each day are probably either buy a light box or take a trip someplace sunny and warm. So I would opt for Hawaii or Acapulco or something. Yes? Okay. What about my glasses? Do they affect the Oh, excellent question. Sunglasses do, regular glasses do not. If you're in your car, as long as you don't have tinted... Ultraviolet? Uh, yeah, we don't need ultraviolet. We need ultraviolet light for vitamin D, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, if you're in your car commuting when it's sunny out, any of you have that? Um, you actually still get 50% of the, the uh, luminance or intensity of light, so you're okay if you in your car. If you don't wear sunglasses at least for those 30 minutes. Now, if you want to prevent the onset, if you're not depressed right now, but you want to prevent the onset of depression, it only takes 15 minutes first thing in the morning. Oh, let me say two other things quickly and then I'll talk about the vitamin D angle. Number one, if you have bipolar depression, you know about bipolar, where, you know, where there's mania on top of the depression at different times, if you have bipolar depression, it is dangerous to get bright light exposure first thing in the morning. Research studies have found that many individuals, about half, who have bipolar depression actually flip over into a very dangerous episode of mania or what we call a mixed state where they have mania and depression simultaneously, where they're suicidal and have lots of energy and impulsivity. That's not a good combination. Um, so if you're bipolar and depressed, you can still benefit from bright light. The best research evidence suggests that it's safest at midday. Midday, not first thing in the morning. Yes. Within one hour of within one hour of awakening, within one hour, the only exception. No matter what time you get up. Within one hour of now, the only exception to this is if you have what we refer to as terminal insomnia, where your body clock has been shifted in such a way that you go to sleep really, really easily, and you start to get drowsy super early, and then you wake up like three in the morning and you can't go back to sleep, or you wake up at four in the morning and you don't want to be awake until six or six thirty. Anybody here have that? If you have that, you want to get your bright light exposure about four hours before your target bedtime, and that'll help push your body clock 
in the right direction. And this is very powerful. My wife had somebody that she worked with who for 10 years had been waking up at between 2.30 and 3 in the morning for 10 years. She tried multiple meds. She tried everything. Nothing helped. I said, honey, we need to give her our, our we have our own light box at home. Let's give her our light box. We're not using it right now. Get, and I, I sent her with like, you know, just handwritten instructions. And a month later, she calls. and She's like, this is a miracle. It's changed my freaking life. Um, I just slept until 7 a.m. for the first time. And like, it's powerful. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Now, vitamin D is another benefit we get from being outside. W remember, we're designed to be outside all the time. What is vitamin D? It's not a vitamin. It's a hormone, right? Why do I call it a hormone? Not a vitamins are nutrients that you have to get from your diet. Hormones are things your body can make. Your body can make all the vitamin D it needs. It just needs a little assist from the sun. Ultraviolet rays hitting your skin. You know what, it, what the building block is? You know what vitamin D is made out of? Cholesterol. <laughs> cholesterol. Yes, your cholesterol level will go down if you have sun exposure in the summertime and you're making vitamin D. Now, the average American is deficient in vitamin D over the winter. In fact, many Americans are deficient in the summertime as well because they love their dermatologist and the dermatologist says slather yourself with SPF 5000, you know, all the time. And um, by the way, as we age, as we get older, we lose our efficiency in making vitamin D. So older Americans are more likely to be deficient than younger Americans. What can you do? Well, vitamin D is anti-inflammatory. Huh. If it's anti-inflammatory, then it's probably antidepressant. Yes. The evidence suggests that it probably is because vitamin D deficiency is a big risk factor for depression. So I would suggest, as we do with the patients in our protocol, that you also consider talking with your doctor about supplementing with vitamin D as well. Great, great question. All right. Um, healthy sleep. How much? I lost my watch here. Okay. We got, oh, eight minutes. Plenty of time. Eight minutes. Pl plenty of time. Healthy sleep. Um, let me just say to you really quickly, the average American gets about 6.7 hours of sleep per night. The average adult. A century and a half ago, the average American adult got nine hours per night. Nine hours per night. Most of us, if we were left on our own in a sleep lab away in a cave, and this has been done actually at Stanford, we would thrive on about eight hours per night. Until we got caught up because we're so sleep deprived, we'd get, we'd get about nine or ten for a while, and then we'd get caught up, and then we'd get about eight per night, and we would just be hitting on all cylinders. Our mood would improve, our cognitive function would improve, our physical performance would improve. Sleep deprivation is a huge trigger of depression. If you want to, to depress somebody's mood, you can start depriving them, especially of the most restorative phase of sleep. Most of us have compromised quantity and quality of sleep. We can benefit from, from both. Now, what's happened? We picked up lots of unhealthy habits in our treatment program. We train individuals on habits of healthy sleep. We have 10 that we emphasize. I've got a few of them here. I'm not going to talk about them all. First, target eight hours per night. By the way, some of you only need seven. How would you know if you're getting enough sleep? You know how you know? Test yourself by putting yourself in a low stimulation setting. You know what happens with a room full of kindergartners, who, by the way, tend to usually get enough sleep? A room full of kindergartners, when they're in a boring assembly, and they're listening to the principal drone on and on, what do they do? They squirm, they fidget. Do they yawn? No. Do they get drowsy? No. If you are in a boring situation and you find yourself yawning and getting drowsy, that's a good sign you're sleep deprived. You know what another good sign is? Go lay down an hour after lunch someday. Go lay down an hour after lunch someday in a um, dark, quiet setting. Put a little sleep mask on if you want or pull the blackout curtains. If you can fall asleep within 10 minutes, you are sleep deprived. Really. Really. If you fall asleep within minutes of your head hitting, hitting the pillow, you're definitely sleep deprived. Now, many of you should be falling asleep the second your head hits the pillow, but the problem is you've been working or you have bright light exposure within an hour of bedtime, and you know what? Even though the light in this room is not bright enough to reset your body clock, it is bright enough to tell your brain the sun hasn't gone down. When your brain sees this light, it interprets it, oh, the sun hasn't gone down yet, which means what? Don't release melatonin to give you that wave of drowsiness because you don't need it, the sun hasn't gone down. So you know what happens? I'll, let me just ask for a show of hands. How many of you have been dog tired, you know you're sleep deprived, and you finally get to the point where you lay down in bed, and you know you need sleep, and you just lay there 
at, for like 45 minutes to an hour at least before the sleep comes. For many of us, that is because either A, we've been working within an hour of bedtime, which keeps our stress response circuitry engaged, or more, uh, more likely, we have indoor lights on. So what does that mean? Within an hour of bedtime, turn off all the overhead lights. Go only for the last hour under low lamp light or candlelight, which is even more relaxing. You will be amazed at how much easier it is to fall asleep. Yes, sir? What about a TV going at the same time? Excellent question. <laughs> is this autobiographical? Um, okay, um, y the TV, if, if it's a typical TV and you're not right on top of it, um, it's, it's probably okay. If, if you're in a completely darked out, blacked out room, TV's across the room, um, it, it's not going to be too much light for you. Um, you know, a lamp light in addition to it that starts to kind of push the envelope a little bit. You want Exactly. Or under like a little pen light. Or, oh, oh or, or an iPad, you know, where it's backlit. The bed is for sleep only and vice versa, not the laptop. Right. The bed is for sleep not only and vice versa. We, why is the bed only for, oh, by the way, I'll make an exception. Uh, no, not me. Sleep researchers. Sleep and sex, okay? Sleep and sex, but nothing else. Why? Why? You want to train your brain and your body to associate the bed with sleep, the same way Pavlov's dog associated the bell with dinner. In other words, just like Pavlov's dog reflexively, unconsciously started slobbering and drooling, we want your body reflexively, unconsciously to go boom and go right to sleep as soon as you get in the bed. Why? Because the bed has only ever been associated with sleep and vice versa. In other words, you're not sleeping in the Barca lounger, Right, or the sofa in the, in the living room, you're sleeping only in bed. Yes? Are you totally screwed if you work nights? Working nights is one of the worst possible things a person can do if they're prone to depression. Okay. Working nights is, I mean, it raises the rate of premature death by orders of magnitude. It raises the rate of all kinds of accidents, illness. I, I mean, I, I don't want to talk you out of it if that's, I mean, but it... it well, I guess I, the full next day, I can't... Exactly. As a clinical researcher, it is one of the worst possible things we can do to our bodies. It's to be avoided at all costs as soon as we can, I would say. Yes? Melatonin is wonderful when it's released naturally by the pineal gland in the center of the brain as a supplement. I'm not a huge fan. And, I, I, and by the way, this is a very controversial position. I have many colleagues whom I love and respect who do not agree with me on this. My own position on it is that when we take melatonin as a supplement, it weakens our own natural melatonin response. And unless we have some sort of pineal gland deficiency tumor, cyst, something like that, we can actually probably train our pineal to release melatonin 45 minutes before our normal bedtime. The best way we can do it, by the way, you guys aren't going to want to hear this. If you have, un oh, exercise helps, bright light helps, but here's what helps even more. If you have unhealthy sleep, go to bed at the same time every night, and even more importantly, get up at the same time every morning. Even if you had a crappy night's sleep, get up at exactly the same time. Set your target, whatever it is, 6.30, 6, 7, 8, my undergraduates, 11 a.m., you know. <laughs> Set the same time every day. Why? What does it do? It powerfully trains your circadian rhythm, and it gives you a profound sleep drive when you need it. It gives you that big melatonin release when you need it, 45 minutes before. Oh, by the way, one quick thing about bright light. Flat screens, such as are found in iPads, laptops, any flat screen gives off blue shifted light. And for reasons that are still mysterious to science, blue shifted light, even when it's dim, can fake out your photoreceptors in your retina into thinking that it's really bright. Let me say that again. If you spend time in front of a blue shifted screen, like a flat screen, an iPad, a laptop, even if you have the, the brightness on dim, it's going to trick your brain into thinking you're sitting in front of bright light, which means the sun hasn't gone down, which means you're not going to get drowsy, which means it's going to interfere with your sleep. Basically, here's it in a nutshell. You're not going to be able to fall asleep easily within 45 minutes of using your iPad or 45 minutes of using your um, laptop in most cases. Red light. Or, if you can change the output into a red light. Yeah, there is, a, there, there is an app now, because this has been discovered, there's an app that you can get that will cause your iPad or your laptop to shift into, into the red spectrum. That's a great point. Somebody had a question? Yeah, wait, go ahead. Some really good deep focus breathing can help. 
Oh, absolutely. There are all kinds of, yeah. There, I mean, there are some wonderful, wonderful ways of, of helping us get in. I mean, basically what it takes to sleep is a tired body and a quiet mind. A tired body and a quiet mind. So that when we crawl into bed, we're ready for that. Let me, uh, in our negative one minutes remaining, um, let me just say one last quick thing about one more point, which is rumination. Do you guys know that word rumination? It means dwelling on, brooding on the same thoughts over and over and over. When we are anxious, when we are depressed, our negative thoughts take possession of us. We can't let go of them. We just chew on them. It's toxic. It's psychologically toxic. Why? Because it amplifies the intensity of our negative moods and it revs up the brain's stress response circuits, which keeps our depression going. So what do we do? Well, in our program, we've got three steps for helping people stop ruminating. The first step is just to notice when you're doing it. Learn how to get really good catching yourself in real time. Every time you catch yourself, decide you're going to shift your focus. You need to redirect your attention elsewhere. What are the kinds of things that work really quickly? Social interaction, and by the way, shared activity, not conversation. That sounds counterintuitive. When we are ruminating and we talk to somebody, we very often drag them into our rumination with us. What has been discovered by clinical research and certainly in our clinical practice is shared activity with somebody else is much better most of the time at breaking rumination than conversation. Unless you are really disciplined and your friend is disciplined so that you, when you talk, you are not talking about anything that you're going to ruminate about. That's very hard to do, by the way. Engaging solo activity, that sounds a little bit prurient. It's not meant to. Um, engaging, that means all of us have things that we need to be able to do when we're by ourselves. We don't have the luxury of social interaction that will capture our attention. For some of us, it's a, it's a video. For some of us, it's being online. For some of us, it's uh, playing a, anybody play a musical instrument? I find that, I play piano, wonderfully anti-ruminative. If I'm brooding over something and I start playing something on keyboard, it just takes me right out of it. I wish we had time to brainstorm a little bit. I'd love to hear from more of you about your best anti-ruminative activities. Writing out your thoughts. Have you ever noticed when you write something down, it's a lot easier to walk away from it? You get it down on paper, you've got things that are on your mind, you can't stop thinking, you write them down. It's like, oh, it's down on paper, I don't have to keep thinking about it. I don't have to burden my memory with keeping that thought afloat. Changing the, the scenery, by the way, most of us who ruminate have pet places that trigger our rumination, again, like Pavlov's dog. We've been conditioned to ruminate in certain spots. Believe it or not, when you're ruminating, if you change the scenery to something novel, especially getting out in nature, there's something about nature that's been recently discovered to be anti-ruminative. And our brains crave the visual stimulation and relaxation that we get from looking at natural sceneries. Oh, and here's the most shocking thing I'm going to tell you tonight. I think I'm going to end on this shocking note. I love this. This is, this is worth the price of admission. Oh, wait, you didn't pay. Um, still, <laughs> worth the price of admission, right, for this. When we're in nature, when we're outside, we are inhaling dust-borne, soil-borne bacteria called Mycobacterium baccae that are found all over the northern hemisphere and most of the southern hemisphere that go into our lungs these are bacteria. Have you heard of probiotic bacteria? Probiotic? These are probiotic bacteria. We get them in our lungs. They cross into our bloodstream. They start interfacing with our immune system and telling our immune system to release factors that travel into our brain and start changing neurochemistry, increasing growth of neurons in circuits that use dopamine and that rev up our pleasure centers. Being outside in nature is bizarrely antidepressant. Bizarrely, yeah, bizarrely antidepressant. But let me just close by saying, um, I, I've written all this down. If you, if you felt like there was a lot of information, there was more that you wanted to know, I'm certainly willing to stay after and answer any questions. But uh, I do have a book, it's called The Depression Cure. Uh, it's available at most booksellers. Oh, there's a copy right, right up here. It looks like this, it's blue. It's kind of pretty. It's got an outdoor sort of scene. Um, it, it, it has a lot of details. We also have a website in our lab at KU that has most of this information, at least in summary form. If you just Google, uh, our, our, pro our program is called TLC, Therapeutic Lifestyle Change. If you Google TLC and, uh, and Kansas or TLC and Alardi or TLC and depression, you'll find it really easily. So thank you guys very much. It's, it's been a pleasure to, to be with you tonight. <laughs>